All right, so we are live and recording. And I'll just set this up here and um, it should be good um, okay. whether you stand up or sit. All right. Should, it'll do great. Okay. Um, Shane, can you hear us? Oh, I'm just, just checking. With, oh, yes. Okay, we're good. Okay. Um, awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the next installment of our class in the Appalachian Natural History Seminar Series. Today we are um, excited to welcome our special guest, Rex Mann, um, whom you have seen in video from Cliff Palace Pond. That was just a couple years ago, right? That video. Um, but we are uh, delighted to have um, Rex here. Uh, Rex graduated um, from the uh, NC State, and North Carolina State University, um, and then worked for the Forest Service for 42 years. Um, across the U.S. South, um, a variety of different yeah. positions. So, would love to hear more about that. However right. much you're interested in sharing about your career. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Retired in 2007 and spent the last what's that? 15 years now. 15 years doing um, a number of things, but among them, foremost among them, volunteering for the American Chestnut Foundation, um, including founding the Kentucky chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. So, we're really excited. Um, mm -hmm. to hear yeah. um, you have this to share with us today and thank you so much for joining all us. all right i refer to myself as a uh, chestnut evangelist if you will because of uh, hey and i am rex man pleasure to be here and uh, heavily involved in a wide effort to restore the chestnut tree and from my personal standpoint and we'll talk about this more later, I believe that the uh, strategy and the science we are using to restore this tree uh, will be very helpful um, when we get about the business restoring other trees that we're losing. Uh, I am a product of Appalachia, as you can tell from my uh, Brooklyn twang here. And, uh, but if uh, if you have difficulty understanding any of the terms, you have a quick question, just let it go and I'll be happy to answer that. All right, so we'll jump in here. I, I did, I'll tell you this, I, I, uh, I did spend 42 years with the Forest Service and much of that time, uh, all my duty stations, most of my, forestry type work was done in the south, a 13 state area from Arkansas to Mississippi to Kentucky. But uh, a huge, probably 20% of my time for most of that period was spent fighting and managing huge wildfires all over the country. So quite often I would spend my summers in the west and uh, that's a whole separate problem that uh, demands a lot of attention because they're not getting any better. The fire situation is not, but uh, my real love is forestry work, particularly working with the forests of the Eastern United States, which is where I grew up. And uh, in my opinion, this is the area that has suffered the most from diseases and insects that we brought in. And we have uh, more species of trees and animals here that are in danger of being lost forever. So if you have a pressing question, jump in there. I'd like to introduce my wife of 55 years, if you can blame, believe that, Miss Anita back there, who's, uh, uh, and the other thing that I'll say is just a, uh, uh, I don't mind telling you, hey man, I'm 77 years old and two years ago, uh, I suffered a stroke, but I was very lucky and I recovered very well. And I'm continuing my work with restoring chestnut. But uh, I would advise any of you as you uh, accumulate a lot of birthdays and you still have something you're very passionate about that you need to work on, don't schedule a stroke. If you still got a tree to restore or something like that, it can really get in the way. But if you wonder about the cane, that's it. I'm gonna sit here probably for most of the time, but uh, we'll jump in here. I'll start by saying that our forests, America's forests are in deep trouble and they're not in good health. 
You may be a little shocked to hear that, but that is the truth. To illustrate that, we are losing many, many species of trees and other plants and many species of wildlife that live in those forests are sick and dying today by the thousands, even as we meet here today. Sadly, stories of, of this type usually don't make the national or cable news. And the real sad part about it is that a huge part of our public, we're mostly an urban nation now, and a huge part of our public are, are not even aware that this destruction is, is taking place. And when I say something like this, that our, that our forests are in deep trouble and poor health, that triggers a bunch of pertinent questions that I'd like to go over with you folks, and they demand answers. And, uh, and to the best of my ability and my this talk I give today, uh, I hope to answer those questions and I hope to leave you with some information on what you as citizens of this great country of ours can help with to heal the land, to restore the trees, the species of trees and plants and animals that we're losing. And we'll focus on that in just a bit. But I want to start with the question, since I've made that statement that we are in, our forests are in poor health. And the first logical question is, well, what is killing our forests and the wildlife living within? Could we have prevented this or can we avoid it? Or is it still going on? And what does this mean to us, you and myself, as citizens of this great country? And probably even more important, what does it mean to you and your children and grandchildren who someday will inherit this land? We're gonna to try to answer those questions, but I'm gonna do it within the context of uh, realism. And I wish I had something different to say here, but there is no evidence on the horizon that this problem will abate or get any better on its own anytime in the future. And I'm gonna tell you in a minute just, just what all uh, we're dealing with, but nature will not heal itself in this situation. A lot of people, believe that, nation, uh, that uh, nature is all powerful, but it can be overwhelmed. And we'll talk about that later. We're gonna be talking about what I think is a very serious problem facing us as a people that has the potential to endanger our very existence as a species. So, I've asked the question, what's causing it? So what are these agents of sickness and death that are making our forests unhealthy and causing death to literally millions of plants and trees and animals that we and our ancestors have enjoyed for centuries? And I'll tell you the enemies that, attack, that are attacking our woodlands are grouped in a huge, that we use a very general term called invasives to explain this. And the simple definition of an invasive is a life form or an organism from somewhere different than where it is today, that it, it originated or evolved in some other part of the world, and it's now located in an ecosystem uh, nowhere close usually to where it originated from. And there's many things that can invade and become established and do damage. And that's the key part of the definition is when you bring a exotic or non-native species into another ecosystem or community of living things that has never been exposed to this invasive creature 
there's the potential there to do severe damage. And we're seeing that everywhere we look today. But these agents of destruction, and this term invasives covers a wide ranging group. It can be very simple life forms, uh, some of which we're very much familiar with today as we recover as a nation from COVID, probably the worst pandemic to uh, strike humanity in a century, at least. So these, these invasives can include very simple life forms or organisms, such as bacteria, fungi, that cause diseases in either plants or animals. It also refers, the invasives can be insects that either feed on the foliage of trees or other plants or else such as the emerald ash borer that you might have possibly have heard of that is destroying millions of ash trees across the east. They may reproduce by burrowing into the tree trunk, forming tunnels which eventually girdle or another word you could use is strangle the tree, that, uh, that it, it affects it to the point where food produced in the leaves cannot move down through the trunk or else moisture, water, and nutrients cannot move up from the ground level. But it's, uh, or else these insects may just simply be other vectors that cause diseases resulting in tree death. Invasives also refer to any kind of exotic or non-native plant or animal or tree. And I'll try to give some examples of these in case you're not familiar with, with some of the invasives we deal with. Uh, for example, there are insects are pretty easy and I'm gonna go over these in some greater depth, but we're all, hearing about or witnessing the death of ash trees, which is a common tree species in this part of Kentucky and in, out throughout the entire Eastern United States. These are, were Asian ins, uh, insects that were brought into this country, either through uh, world trade or international travel. They don't usually get here on their own. The uh, invasive, invasive almost always has been transported from its place of origin to the place it finds itself now uh, by something else, normally usually a human, that we are the ones who spread these vectors. So it can be either microbial uh, stuff that causes diseases or insects or, or foreign or exotic trees or plants or animals. Uh, have any of you ever heard about the Burmese pythons right now that have been turned loose in the Everglades in South Florida? And these things were purchased as pets. You know, we can do that. But when they got to a very large size and they weren't able to take care of them anymore, they said, well, the logical place, I don't want to kill it. I'm gonna turn it loose. Now, here's a swamp, let's turn this thing loose there. And they are in there now by the thousands and they get huge size. And basically this uh, Burmese python is destroying most of the small animal life in that park, the Everglades National Park. And that have been there for thousands, probably millions of years. But this new predator, that has been introduced and is now well established is taking out the life of, of all the small animals that many of the visitors go in there to see. And there's an active effort to try to trap these things and get them out of there. But all these exotics, these invasives that I'm talking about here share certain characteristics that I'll go over with you. First, they all are exotics. They are non-native. And they have been brought into a different ecosystem. And they didn't come here on their own 
almost always they have been transported by some other vector, we call it, and that's normally humans. As we move around the world trading with each other or uh, doing international traffic, uh, flying and so forth. Now these non-natives, usually <clears throat> what happens when they are transported from where they originated from to a different system, if there are any predators or enemies of this life form that control their numbers, these were left behind as, a, as usually is the case. We didn't bring them, whoever brought the uh, Burmese python or, or these insects in did not gather up the things that kept these creatures in control as far as their number, they were left behind. So what often happens, what normally happens, is that these pests all of a sudden find themselves in a totally new world where living conditions and conditions for reproduction, which is a powerful force in all life forms, are very good. And the enemies are few. So when they become established, there is often and most of the time there is a very rapid spread uh, as they move from whatever they're attracted to to something else of the same species. For example, emerald ash borers. Once they get into a new territory and they're established themselves in a tree and they reproduce, they, there's a very rapid spread to another ash tree nearby to attack that thing. So there's a rapid rate of spread, and this results every time in a, rapid, a, a severe loss to native species, and maybe even the extinction of some species. There's a very real popular, uh, possibility that this emerald ash borer will cause several of the species of ash trees to become extinct. That's what's, that's what's happening to us. The other thing is that once they become established in a new ecosystem, they're usually here to stay. I'm gonna refer a lot of times today to a, a tree that I'm very passionate about. Uh, and I spent 42 years working in the woods. I grew up hearing American chestnut stories from my parents and relatives in Appalachia, Western North Carolina. And uh, I have to tell you, if you didn't know this, this was a critical tree, not only to the indigenous people that first lived here, but also to most of our ancestors, the early settlers who came in. It was an extremely important tree. Uh, the wood was very rot resistant, so it was used by the pioneers for everything from cradles to coffins. And it also had the unique ability to produce fruit or chestnuts in huge numbers every year. You seldom had a crop failure. And this thing about, in some places, 25% of all the trees that grew in the forest at that time were American chestnuts. So the loss of this species was a tremendous loss to uh, Appalachian culture and also to the culture of many of our indigenous people out there to whom chestnut was a huge part of their life. Okay. So, so uh, is there, was there, uh, I guess let me, let me just start with this. The enemy as far as what brings these invasives to our country is us, humans. We and our ancestors were what, we were the ones who either brought these uh, invasives in or we allowed them to be brought in through lax laws, the controlling trade or travel. And, and we are absolutely swamped with creatures that are not native to this country and that are doing tremendous harm. 
So the next question that should be asked was, uh, is who is doing that? Uh, who is spreading these uh, agents of destruction? Uh, and was it part of a plot or a conspiracy to happen, to see this, to do damage to our native system? I'll tell you the enemy is us, but there is no evidence that any of this, these actions was intentional, that they were done to cause damage to our native insects. And Eve, there was no plot or a conspiracy. But what was evident from the very beginning is that ignorance prevailed. Now, I might differentiate just a little bit between ignorance and stupidity. Ignorance is simply that you don't have all the information you need for a particular problem. You simply don't know. I would think that stupidity is that, well, even if you did know and you knew these things caused damage, you would still do it anyway. Now that would border on stupidity perhaps, but I, through this talk, I will use this term and I believe it's correct that ignorance prevailed. So as we move ahead, one of our major tasks is to educate our people so that they will realize that this problem we're, we're dealing with for our environmental systems is very serious. Okay, we also have to remember that at this time when, and most of this began when our country was being settled two or three centuries ago, that science and technology was in its very early stages of development. So th there was little, and, and even though at that time, uh, pandemics, the early populations in the 15 and 1600s were, were severely affected by the disease pandemics that were uh, wreaking havoc all over the world, except in North and South America. But we did not know what caused these pandemics, nor was the science of treating these very advanced. We simply did not know. There was also very little knowledge at this time about he, how these ecosystems of, or groups of different life forms, such as a forest, which is an ecosystem. We didn't really know how these systems worked at that time. They're very complex. And the, the uh, knowledge of, of how they actually affect each, how each life form affects the other life forms in there, we, we simply didn't know that. Nor did we have any idea of what happened if we took a life form from some other part of the world and dumped it into this, this, life, this system that surrounds us. Now this destruction by invasive diseases began to manifest itself as soon as Europeans, people from the old world, and I use that term to describe Europe, Asia, and Africa. This was the parts of the world where that uh, most of our ancestors came from. But most, <clears throat> this destruction began immediately because the first people that came in carried uh, these invasive diseases. Uh, and what happened, as soon as people started, as Europeans started coming in to North or South America, people began to die. Native people began to die. And North and South America, these two continents was, happened to be occupied at that time by as many as 50 million indigenous people or tribal people. But within a period of just two or three centuries, all of Eastern North America, which is where our ancestors and the early settlers came into first, and within two to three centuries after we discovered the place, North and South America, it was settled. That, that the settlement had pretty much uh, occurred. Now, 
within that same time period of two to 300 years, wave after wave of diseases, everything from smallpox to chickenpox to measles and mumps, influenza, had struck the native people and they died like flies, I'm telling you. And within that two to three century time period while settlement was going on, up to 90% of these 50 million people were killed by, by uh, exotic diseases, wave after wave of them. And we need to know that most of these diseases arose in the old world. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about that. The old world again being Asia, Europe, and Africa. This is where most of the contagious diseases first arose. The diseases that affect humans, even like COVID, share one thing in common. They all originally had a host that was an animal, a wild animal, or in many cases, domesticated animals. For example, uh, uh, smallpox came from cattle, influenza came from pigs. And we as humans began domesticating animals about the same time that we started farming which was about 11,000 years ago. At that time, people and their domesticated animals lived very close together, close contacts. And so invariably, this disease that was first located, let's say on a pig, did what COVID is doing today. And it mutated and developed the ability to jump from that animal to a human. So most of the diseases that are killers of humans first arose on domesticated animals. And most of the animals such as cattle, sheep, goats, pigs were domesticated in Asia or Europe or Africa. And even though agriculture started in the new world, which is North and South America, about the same time, there were few, if any, animals domesticated here in what's now the United States. And the other thing you need to know about this, in the old world at that time, where these diseases were all arising, up to between 40 and 50% of all children died from one of these diseases before the age of six years old. We don't read much about that. There were no newspapers then or TV or anything like that, but the diseases had arisen and they'd become what is called endemic, which means they are there all the time. And 40 to 50% of all the children caught these diseases and died before the age of six. It was amazing. Uh, cause of death. However, the survivors who had these diseases, much like COVID is today, what happened is they developed either partial or complete immunity to that disease. And if you've had COVID uh, lately, within the past year or two, you've probably got about as high level of protection as you can as you can get, because you, we have these unique bodies that produce antibodies that are searching out the uh, COVID uh, virus as it enters your body and trying to kill it. So these early explorers that came to North and South America were obviously, they had survived these childhood diseases. So almost all of them had some level of immunity or resistance to these terrible diseases. The native people in North and South America basically had none. Even though they had, they, uh, had developed agriculture, they had not domesticated animals, which was the primary source for these terrible diseases to move from animals to humans. 
And in addition to that, they had been almost totally surrounded by oceans on all sides. And remember at that time, there was little or no intercontinental travel. They had not been exposed to people from the old world of Europe or Asia or Africa. And so with no terrible diseases here, they had no need to develop resistance to something that they'd never been exposed to. Our ancestors, primarily our ancestors from Europe and Asia, where the diseases first arose, once they had it, if they didn't die from it, they developed some resistance to it. So most of these early settlers that came into North and South America, most of the early explorers had been exposed to the diseases and they had some level of resistance, but the native people had none and they, they died like flies. Not up to 90% of this 50 million that lived here. And I'll tell you, there's no other death toll affecting humans in, in our history that exceeds that of native people in the new world when they were first exposed to old world diseases. Never been a death toll like that. And it had huge impact. And put this whole invasive thing into a little better focus here. It's important that we understand that this land we inherited about two and a half centuries ago, at that time was one of the most productive and diverse chunks of land anywhere on the globe. It supported a, a huge variety of life forms. And in fact, had sustained these 50 million indigenous people for thousands of years as they pursued their lifestyle of subsistence farming and hunter gathering, where they, they basically grew a few crops, but they also lived off the land. Hey man, eating these chestnuts that were produced, if you will. But this land that had sustained all these indigenous people, the soil productivity here and the abundance of wildlife and plant life was a powerful draw to the poor people who lived in the old world, to Europe, in Europe or Asia or Africa. And many of these people at that time in the old world, uh, poor people didn't have the ability to own land. You know, in, in almost everybody farmed, but at that time, you generally farmed and did work for somebody else who owned the land. And just the, but the very thought that you could come to this new world and maybe own a piece of property that was yours, that you could farm as you wished and do whatever you wanted to, that was unheard of. And all the word that was coming back was it was such a productive land that it was easy to farm. So it was a powerful draw for these thousands of people, even though the voyage over here was usually about six weeks in terrible conditions and many died on the way, but it was a whole new way of life and there was no scarcity of settlers who came to this amazing land that had been discovered. And once they were here, they learned from the native people and they adopted the same lifestyle Hey, we learned that most, most what we know right now about our farming from the native people who were already here, who were growing foods that people in the old world had never seen before. But one of the, uh, and so they, they came here and immediately began changing the landscape in a variety of ways that continue to this day to the point where I've often thought that if time travel were possible and somebody who lived in this new world thousands of years ago, if they were able to come back through time and see the world as it exists today, the landscape, odds are they wouldn't recognize it as the place where they grew up. It has changed that much. You know, much of the forest has been eliminated, but that continues to this day. But one of the biggest things that happened was this death that we delivered to the native people when 90% of them 
were killed off. These were farmers, these were hunters, and, and it had an extreme effect on, on the land. Uh, not only was tribal culture and culture and uh, uh, lifestyle, their farming techniques destroyed because there just simply weren't enough people to farm the land, uh, the wildlife populations were really affected. I've got an old friend, uh, an archeologist that uh, did a lifetime of research in the caves and the cliff houses of Eastern Kentucky. And he's told me how when, as he was exploring and trying to learn from these sites where people had lived for thousands and thousands of years, that he found and was able to determine the ages of bones from creatures that aren't even here anymore. Everything from woolly mammoths to mastodons to giant beaver, species of bear that are no longer here. He found those bones in the oldest areas that he was doing research on, but he never found the bones of a bison or a buffalo or an elk. Both of these animals were very common when European first, Europeans first came to Kentucky in the uh, 1750s or so, buffalo and elk were very common, but they weren't there. They didn't show up in the record until this huge epidemic of diseases had killed off about 90% of the native people who lived here. Bison and buffalo, bison and elk are Western species. They originated in the West. So what this tells you, there were so many people here at that time living in North America, and they had developed such hunting skills that if an elk or a bison was able to get across the Mississippi River and trying to establish themselves in the Eastern US, they probably didn't make it. They were probably hunted and killed by, uh, by the local people. And these herds of buffalo and bison in Eastern North America did not occur until the great die-off that resulted from European diseases. But settlers immediately began clearing the land for farming, cutting the forest. We brought in domesticated animals uh, that had never been in North America, such as uh, 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 pigs and cattle, and all kinds of bird life sheep and goats. And as a general rule, we just turned these three things loose on the land to forage for themselves. All right. In addition, horses and oxen were brought in. And so for the first time in history, there was a, an animal here that could be used to plow farmland. Before that time, there was no way that native people in North America could plow the land that they raised crops on. They had to do it by hand, a sharp stick or, or some other pretty uh, basic tool. But once the horses and oxen were brought in, they had the ability to, to plow the farmland and make agriculture much more efficient. The changes that occurred in the world after Columbus discovered America are amazing. But one of the most important things is the food crops that they discovered here that changed the history of the world. And a couple that come to mind that affected life the most in the old part of the world, in the old world, was maize or corn and potatoes, which came from South America. This was a completely new type of food that the old world people had never seen before. The early explorers immediately began uh, spreading these foods around the world where the farmers adopted them and farmed them. And it totally changed the eating habits and uh, the way of life of people in the old world for the better. Now, the assault on our forest that I opened with here a moment ago really gained momentum in the early years 
of the 20th century. I'm a chestnut nut, I'll tell you, and I've spent most of my career trying to, uh, I've spent that career watching the forest recover from uh, 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 the loss of the chestnut tree. But during the 19th, the 20th century, the assault on our forests really gained momentum. In 1904, there was a strange new disease discovered in New York City that was on the native chestnut trees that grew there. They soon discovered that this disease came into America on Japanese chestnuts. These are trees in, from Japan that had developed an immunity to this disease, which was called a chestnut blight. But once these, this disease was brought in in 1904, between 1904 and the end of the Second World War, which was a period of about 40 years, 4 billion American chestnut trees were killed by this disease. Now, to give you an idea of how many that were, if you could lay these things end to end, it would go around the globe. You could, you could build a a string of, uh, of, uh, of chestnut trees that would circle the globe. Okay, so we chestnut blight was brought in also during this early 20th century, a new disease called Dove Dutch elm disease was brought into this country from Europe. And within a very short while, all the elm trees, the American elm trees were killed. And this was a favorite shade tree for our early cities and towns. A couple of decades later, a new disease called butternut or white walnut disease was brought in, probably from Asia. And within just a short while, it killed off 80% of all the white walnut trees that grew in North America. Then about the middle of the last century, we really got busy and we, we as people brought in a whole host of foreign insects into what's now the Eastern United States. I mentioned the ash borer. And this thing, you think baseball bats here because that is what baseball bats are made of is ash. But they are busily killing millions upon millions of ash trees. There's about 8 billion ash trees growing in the United States. And it is very possible, unless we come up with a cure for this problem, all of those are going to be lost. There's another kind of insect that we, was brought in from Asia called an adelgid from Asia. And, and these things, we've got one species of this little insect that right now is wiping out millions of balsam fir trees from the mountains of our Appalachians. This was a relic species that actually originally came from Canada. It came down here uh, shortly before the last ice age. It was moved south by the advancing cold. It survived since the ice age on the tops of the high mountains in Appalachia. And during that time period, it became the favorite Christmas tree for the world. And it's now grown commercially, but uh, the, this adelgid insect is taking it out. There's another insect of this same type that uh, is, uh, how am I doing for time? Am I getting close? Okay. Okay. But this adelgid is also uh, wiping out Eastern hemlock trees. Why is that important to us? Simply because it keeps, this is the species that keeps this water in our trout streams cold enough for trout to reproduce. If you did not have that shade, trout would not reproduce there. We're losing most of our native bats, and there are many of them. And you might ask, what good's a bat? Well, if you talk to any naturalist or somebody that spends their lives in the woods, you will find out or be told that they're very important to our ecosystems because they do pollination for many flowers that nothing else does. 
And they also are important because they control nocturnal or nighttime insects because they, they hunt at night. There's a foreign disease called white nose syndrome that basically is killing all, most of our bats. Almost all of our freshwater rivers and lakes in the east are infected with zebra mussels. This is a small uh, aquatic species native to Russia and the Ukraine, odd, oddly enough, that was brought in through shipping into the Great Lakes. And this thing has a terrible effect on fish and other aquatic life. And it also really messes up the quality and taste of our drinking water. Am I getting close to the end of the class? Oh my goodness. Okay. So I'm painting a pretty uh, dire picture here for you of what we're doing to the land. So I suggest we quickly ask another question, and that is, what can we do to solve this problem? Is it even possible to solve this problem? Well, I'll give you an old forester's perspective on this that I believe, yes, we can solve this problem. But just as it takes, I think, a village to raise a child, for an ecosystem, for the damage that we have done to our land, it takes a nation's commitment to try to cure that, to fix that. And it can only be done by humans, even though we're the ones that brought all of these uh, invasives in here to start with, we're also the only ones that can undo the damage and heal the land. Why is that? Simple. We're the only creature blessed with this piece of hamburger between our ears that we call a brain. We are the only creatures that can read and learn science and technology and then apply that knowledge in miraculous ways to solve huge problems like COVID, uh, all the other problems that we're dealing with, including this one. But it will only be solved through science and technology. It will not heal itself. From a personal level, one of the things that I hope to do is, and this is based on some work that I've done with Native people. I recently uh, played a role in forging a partnership between the organization I now belong to, the American Chestnut Foundation, and the Eastern Tribe of Cherokee Indians, to whom Chestnut was very important. We developed a partnership where we, the chestnut group, teach them all we know about growing chestnuts. And in, ten, in return, they serve as a demonstration area for how we're going to restore this chestnut tree. They have about 80,000 acres of land surrounding the Great Smokies National Park. One of the things I want to do is to form a coalition of Native American people all over the East have them become spokespeople for cleaning up this mess we have made of our land, but also as advocates for using cutting edge science to solve these problems of the species we are losing. So somewhere I, I, I'm, I'm very much okay if somebody wants to find out much more about this Kenton to leave my email address with these guys. But we are going to try to form a nonprofit. We have a, a possibility of getting a very significant grant to try to make this happen. And we intend to uh, recruit anybody that's interested in, in leaving a better land for our children and grandchildren. And using this knowledge, this technology that we have used to bring the chestnut tree back, use that same science, often controversial, to restore all the other trees that I just went down through the list that we are losing. And I believe it could be done. So with that, I think I'll hush and, and try to answer any questions anybody might have. Let's thank our speaker. Ah. Absolutely, surely could. Yes, sir. Well, 
the main thing is, again, I grew up here in these stories and this is the only tree in America that has a fan club. And what it is, it's people who grew up in Appalachia that heard stories from their ancestors about what a role this tree played in their life. And, and when, when we lost it, it, it had a tremendous impact. So it's part of my culture. It's, it's what I, the Appalachian culture almost was destroyed once we lost the chestnut tree. But thank you. Thank you for letting me come. Yeah. If anyone else has questions, you should feel free to come over and ask. Um, no worries at all.